Hello everyone and welcome back to the last little section of Duns Scotus's commentary on Aristotle's Metaphysics 9. Uh, today, in this last little bit, we're going to be looking at the replies to the arguments that we've already seen. Um, now worth noting, a lot of these arguments he's already gone over, so I'm probably just going to go over them again briefly. And in a lot of cases, we just see him doing the same thing, just sort of, ref sort of referring back to what he's already said. Uh, so I'll do, I'll go through that when we go through. I'll give a brief reminder of what's been said as well. Uh, so with that, let's get into it. In reply to the first argument, it is evident that a power, insofar as it is called will, is not a power for bringing about contraries at the same time, but rather a power that can determine itself to either of them. The intellect is not like this. So again, this is, I would say, his central thesis. This is the main thing that he's trying to uh, trying to prove uh, throughout this entire section, throughout this entire reading. Uh, he's trying to show that the that the will is a rational power. It is a power which is disposed to opposites, not in the uh, the sort of minor um, derivative sense that the intellect is. Right, it's capable of uh, contraries uh, in the sense of it can uh, right one act of the power can elicit opposite reactions uh, or opposite uh, effects in different things, but rather that it's capable of determining itself to either of a pair of contraries or either of a set of contraries. That's the key part, and that is his key distinction here that he wants to emphasize, that the will is this kind of thing, this unique kind of thing, which can determine itself to one of several ends. Right? And that's what makes the will unique. So continuing on, one might object, can I be not sitting now, given that I am in fact sitting? I reply, a proposition to the effect that this is possible, understood in the composed sense as affirming that the two opposites are possible together, is false. For such a proposition states that there is a power for opposites to be true at the same time. As for the divided sense, some would say that when there is sitting, the sitting exists necessarily, in keeping with the statement from De Interpretatione 1, that everything that is, when it is, necessarily is, and that nothing that is not in fact true is possible in that very moment, but only in some prior instant in which it was possible for what in fact comes about not to come about at the time in question. I'm going to pause there. Um, he's expositing Aristotle here. Aristotle is talking about the doctrine of what's known as the necessity of the present, uh, again, his point, uh, as I've mentioned before uh, in a uh, previous section, um, his point here is that if, uh, for any given moment, uh, what there is a state of things that is true. And given that it's true, it can't be otherwise, right? For it to be otherwise would be a kind of contradiction. Uh, but he's going to try and put some nuance on this claim so that we don't have a kind of um, what later philosophers will call a modal collapse, right? a collapse of possibility into a necessary present. So continuing on, they evidently cannot sustain the claim that the will is now a power for the opposite of what is in the will. At this point, it would be tedious to explain the absurdity of this position, that necessity and contingency are not proper conditions of being when they exist, but necessity is and contingency never is given that when something does not exist, it does not exist either necessarily or contingently, as well as how the authoritative passage from De Interpretatione does not support their view, which rests on the fallacy of confusing the composed and the divided sense and the fallacy of inferring something unqualifiedly true from something true in a certain respect. So here again, he is just sort of reiterating what he said in the first half of this paragraph, All right back at the beginning here, uh, and he's just pointing out that uh, that the uh, the person who makes this objection uh, is is relying on a kind of equivocation. Uh, he's he's the objector that is uh, is saying that uh, that the present each you know facts about what in fact is um, are true and because they are true and because they they obviously aren't otherwise that they cannot be otherwise. He wants to say that yeah in the divided sense that might be the case right it's true that that you know because something is that it can't be other than it is right the law of non-contradiction but he still wants to maintain that it could be and could have been right things could be different than they are there's nothing logically necessitating that things are the way that they are right otherwise uh, the entire not just the present but the past and the future would collapse into uh, causal necessity 
uh, right? And we can't have that. So uh, let's continue. Alternatively, one could say that when the will has a certain volition, it has that volition contingently, and that volition is contingently from the will at that time. For if it is not from the will contingently at that time, it is never from the will contingently, since it is not from the will at any other time. Just as the volition is in the will contingently, so too the will is at that time a power for the opposite of that volition, understanding at that time in the divided sense. That is, I do not mean that the will can will the opposite simultaneously with willing what it in fact wills, but rather that, again, understanding this in the divided sense, in the very instant in which it wills one thing, it has the power to will the opposite, rather than willing what it in fact wills, not necessarily, but contingently. So again, what he's saying here uh, about the divided sense uh, as opposed to the, um, to the combined sense, um, sorry, composed sense. Uh, the divided sense he's talking about here is considering them as two separate propositions rather than as a single disjunct, as a single or statement, as a single opposition. Right? So what he's saying here, uh, if I'm putting it as simply as possible, is that the will chooses A, but the will also can choose B. Right? And that's true because uh, before the will makes the choice or even as the will makes the choice, the will is capable of choosing A and the will is capable of choosing B. The fact that the will chooses A does not mean that the will is no longer capable of choosing B. Right? The will still has the power to choose both. It's just that only one of those powers is exercised. Right? So because of this, because the will still has the power to choose between these two opposites, what that means is the will uh, still is capable of determining itself, even though it has already determined itself. And what that means is we now have uh, we now have a the result of the will's choice as being contingent. To go back to uh, the more classical use of contingency, right? That makes a contingent upon the choice of the will, right? It depends upon the choice of the will. It, it's uh, it's causally uh, and even we would say existentially dependent upon the choice of the will. If the will had not chosen a, a would not exist, and therefore a does not need to exist. It does not exist necessarily. So uh, let's continue to the second argument. If this argument is meant to apply to the will, I will say that the will can act without any determination prior to its act. Thus, the first determination, first both in time and in nature, is in the will's performing of its own act. And so if it cannot be true in any act at all unless it is first determined, is applied to the will, it is false. Again here, uh, he's already more or less explained this. This is just sort of reiterating uh, reiterating what's already been said when he outlined the arguments initially. If, on the other hand, the argument is meant to apply to the intellect as cognizing opposites, then it's true that the intellect cannot, with respect to something external, unless it is determined by something else, since of itself the intellect has to do with external things in the mode of nature. It lacks the power to determine itself to one or the other of a pair of opposites. Therefore, it will do either both or nothing. And if one should conclude from this that the intellect is not a full-blown rational power, I will grant that conclusion in keeping with my prior discussion. If in, indeed, if per impossibile, the intellect existed by itself the, uh, without the will, but together with the inferior powers, nothing would ever come about otherwise than determinately in the mode of nature. And there would be no power sufficient for bringing about either of the two opposites. So again, he is reiterating his point here that the intellect, if uh, the intellect is not a rational power, it is a natural power, so long as what you mean by that is his precise definition here, that, uh, that it's capable of, uh, of discerning between two opposites and not just um, you know, cognizing opposite things, uh, even in a single act. Right? Uh, so he says, um, Right? It will do either both or nothing right? when it's presented, by, uh, presented with a pair of opposites. Right? So it's presented with uh, the question A or not A. The intellect will determine the answer to the question. It will cognize both A and not A. It'll understand both contraries. It will discern between the two. It'll, it'll understand which one is correct, if one is correct, and if the intellect is functioning properly but it will not make the choice between the two because it's not capable of choosing between A and not A, like the will is, 
all the intellect does is determine which one is correct if one is correct uh, or if not capable of doing so then it can eat at least uh, cognize or understand the the difference or the opposition between the two all right so let's move on in reply to the third argument some say that a power can have an act concerning opposites that are within the scope of its first object which in the case of an act of will they identify as the good either genuine or apparent but not an act concerning the opposite of its first object which they identify as the bad qua bad uh, so to clarify here uh, before i move on uh, he's saying that uh, he's responding to roughly speaking uh everyone uh, quite frankly everyone would everyone before scotus more or less within the western tradition will say this going back to socrates at the very least um, they will say that the will is capable of uh, of willing the good but is only capable of willing the good uh, and is not capable of willing bad for its own sake right you cannot you are not capable of choosing something that you do not at least perceive to be good in some way right given the choice and i've used this example in class at least given the uh, excuse me given the choice between uh you know cake pie and a pile of dog poop for dessert uh the you're not going to choose the dog poop right the will is on the on the ordinary way of understanding things is not capable of choosing a pile of steaming dog poop for dessert because there is nothing good there is nothing appealing about it now you might think of an exception and say well maybe i want to choose it just so i can show you that i'm capable of choosing it well okay then in that case you're not choosing the dog poop you're choosing the particular choice you're choosing to uh you're choosing the choice of exercising your will or you're choosing to spite me right <laughs> or you're choosing to demonstrate scotus or uh, you know the voluntarist position as opposed to the intellectualist position right in which case you're still choosing something which is good in itself right it is it is good at least in some respect right choosing something bad because it is bad is typically still understood to be impossible so let's see what scotus has to continue uh continues to say about this uh, similarly with respect to acts they say that the will can have opposite acts willing and willing against concerning anything in which something of the character of the first object of each act namely some aspect of good in the case of willing and some aspect of bad in the case of willing against is found there is no aspect of bad found in the ultimate end and they evidently hold that the will is not a rational power with respect to certain things other than the ultimate end i will not here pursue a discussion of these matters or of whether the will is determined to will the end uh, and to will against what is bad qua bad uh, i will briefly touch on this though uh, even though scotus kind of pushes this aside and i think he pushes it aside because he kind of he kind of has to agree with this right <clears throat> that the will wills what is good qua good and wills against or rejects uh, what is bad qua bad right it's just that the will can well it's just that there is almost nothing which is purely good and there's there is nothing which is purely bad right um anything is perceived of as a mix of good and bad um so even uh, even really really good things there can be something bad about them even if that even what's bad about them even if what's bad about them is uh that they're mutually exclusive with something else good right so they can still be maybe not willed against in the fullest sense and if you're if you're looking for more details on this distinction um i discuss it in another video linked below uh check the description for that uh because this is a fine distinction that kind of um very common in the scholastic period but kind of gets lost uh since then um but any choice uh on this model uh can be considered in this sense right can be considered in the sense of well what is the good about the choice i'm making and while maybe you cannot if there is a pure good right the ultimate end he's talking about willing willing god for god's own sake right that's what he's talking about here um if it is possible to will against that it would only have to be in kind of a in, in kind of an uh, a mediated sense uh, that you're not willing against god per se you're willing something else which is good in a limited sense over the will of will of god or the will for god in which case you're not exactly willing against god you're just not willing god right you're just willing something else more so 
and that leads you to will against God, right? So he 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 follows Anselm in this uh, in one of my um, one of my lectures about Anselm as well. Uh, I, I lay out how this in particular this kind of choice works. So hopefully that uh, that might wind up uh, clarifying what he's what he's going at here. Uh, and I know I, I spent a lot more time on this particular little bit than Scotus does. Uh, main reason for that is he does this elsewhere, and so he doesn't really think that this is the right place for that discussion. Uh, it's a great discussion to have, but again, it's not. It maybe doesn't belong here exactly. So continuing uh, through the next few, which are relatively short. The reply to the fourth argument, the one about the sun, is clear above in my response to the first objection against Aristotle. Just as a reminder, he's talking about the sun having opposite effects. It hardens clay and softens wax or water, right? And he says, well, that's just based on the disposition of the objects. Uh, and that's all, um, right? So just as a reminder, we can go. you can go back to look at his actual argument. To the fifth argument, it can be said, in keeping with what I say at the beginning of the first article, that cold never does anything towards the being of heat. It does, however, do something such that, once it has been done, something else can cause greater heat. For example, it constricts something so that its interior heat will not be diffused, and thus the concentrated heat causes greater heat. As for the throwing of a ball, Although there is indeed a certain contrariety between the rebounding motion and the direct motion, as much contrariety as is required between the wares that terminate local motion, there is no formal contrariety, since one who moves something violently towards some ware uh, moves it towards every ware that can be attained through that motion. If it can attain every such ware through its direct motion, that is how it will be moved. If not, it will rebound and the rebounding motion will continue until a motion proportionate to the violence of the mover has been completed. Neat, he discovered inertia. Uh, and by discovered, I mean, it was already understood as a principle, right? Um, I mean, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't mathematically formalized like it was later on, um, but this was understood, right? That something, when it is moved, is gonna continue moving. It's just when it's acted upon by an outside force, to use later scientific terminology, that may change how it moves, right? And so it, something will retain its momentum, more or less. Uh, and the same will go for cold, right? So something can, in a really, really indirect sense, cause an opposite, <clears throat> excuse me, cause an opposite effect, but only indirectly, right? Cold can cause something to become heat, become, become hotter, but only in the sense that uh, a better modern example of this might be, uh, suppose that you, I live in Florida, so this is a very familiar sensation to me. Suppose you're outside uh, and it is very hot, right? so you're sweating. Uh, and so you decide to come inside where it is nice and cold and air conditioned. So you do, you come inside. Um, but it's nice and cool and air conditioned, right? Your air conditioning is set to 65 because you're rich and you can afford such luxuries. Um, and you sit there in your, uh, in your, in your sweat, in your wet clothes, and you begin to get cold. Right? You could, in that sense, say, not unreasonably, that you are be cold. You are cold because it is hot out, right? Because if it hadn't been so hot out, you would not have. You wouldn't have the 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 significant difference which is making you feel cold. You also would not be, uh, you know, drenched in sweat. Maybe you wouldn't have your air conditioning set to sixty five, right? So you can say that in, a, in an indirect sense, the heat outside is causing you to be cold. But again, only in a very indirect sense. And he wants to say the same thing about, uh, about bouncing a ball, right? Throw a ball at a wall, it rebounds back. Yeah, your motion, you know, in direction, uh, in your, in, you know, direction east towards the wall is causing the ball to move west, but only kind of, right? Your motion east caused the ball to go east. It's just that it hit the wall and that caused it to rebound back west or whatever. Right? So yeah, you're you're causing an opposite effect, but only doing so very indirectly through various mediate causes, inter intermediary causes, we might say. All right, continuing. This and any other contingency is reflected in refracted rays and in other contexts does not introduce any non-rational power, the sort of indifference characteristic of a rational power. Same kind of thing. He's talking about light and the, the effect of light and heat. So continuing on. As for the last argument, all passive powers without exception are of themselves powers for contradiction. Granted, 
If a necessarily existing form necessarily depended on matter, the composite would be incorruptible, and the matter would necessarily be actualized by that form. But that would not be in virtue of any necessity on the part of the matter, but rather on the, rather on the part of the form. Active powers, by contrast, are powers for contradiction in the way that Aristotle explains with the words being and not being. If one understands being and not being to indicate a passive power that is brought close but not or not brought close, then every active power whose action depends on a passive power can be a power for contradiction, not of itself, but in virtue of something else. If one understands it to indicate an impediment, then every natural corruptible active power can be impeded, even by another natural active cause. But no natural power has of itself the power to elicit opposite actions concerning one and the same object, or has of itself the power to act and not act. That is the way in which rational power is a power for contrariety or contradiction. Therefore, that proposition does not undermine the distinction as Aristotle intended to draw it. So, okay, he's saying here, um, this relies on a kind of hylomorphic dualistic model of form and matter. Right? He understands form to be incorruptible. In other words, form uh, is, is not created or destroyed. Form being a pattern of information, more or less. Um, it's not something that comes into being or passes out of being. It's simply something which actualizes or applies to different matter, right? But to say that the uh, that a passive power, a natural passive power, um, admits of opposites right? is to say that a natural passive power, uh, like form, right, something which does not act, does not change, does not does not cause, but merely sustains, right? To say that it's necessary, um, rather than contingently caused by something else, right? Rather than instantiated, to say that it's necessary means that matter is necessarily informed, meaning that the composite, right? The actual being, the actual substance, the actual thing, cannot either come into being or pass out of being. Things never change, in other words. And he says, obviously, that's absurd. Things do obviously change. I would go further than this and to say that not only do things change, uh, but we, we should say we should note here that the uh, hylomorphic dualism, this idea of form informing matter, right, and that being the kind of the, the, the metaphysical structure of objects, of beings. Right? The whole point of that and why Aristotle came up with this as a uh, as a concept, I mean, kind of tracing back to Plato, but why Aristotle applied it in the way that he did was as a way of solving this problem of uh, permanency and change, right? Uh, so if you go back to the pre-Socratics, there were all sorts of problems, uh, whether that was the uh, the sort of um, the Zeno's paradoxes of motion, that things cannot possibly change, uh, or the sort of Heraclitean, everything is, everything is flux, everything is constantly changing. The form-matter distinction managed to preserve continuity, uh, changelessness in form, while also preserving change in matter and had these interact in certain ways. Right? Without that interaction, without that interaction being contingent, right, it falls into one of the previous two problems. Uh, Scotus here pointing out it, it falls into the problem of permanence, of unchangingness. So basically, Obviously, right, this isn't what Aristotle meant because this would contradict Aristotle's whole point in applying the distinction between form and matter to metaphysics. Right? And so it can't be that a, a passive power is this kind of thing. The only kind of thing that has that can be the source of this kind of contingency rather than an effect of this kind of contingency uh, is the will, is an active rational power. Right. And the only act of rational power that he's outlined here is the will. Right. And because he's ruled out the intellect above. See the, the previous page. All right. So that is all we have for this section of, uh, of Scotus's commentary on Aristotle's metaphysics. Hopefully uh, this has been relatively clear. I tried to make this as clear as possible despite its uh, complexity. Um, and hopefully we've gathered something from this. Hopefully we've learned something from this. And hopefully we have some fantastic discussions about this. Uh, if you would like to uh, to carry out a discussion, uh, check out the link to the WordPress, uh, the blog posts uh, associated with this, which will be linked below. Uh, it'll also be linked in the playlist. Uh, 
Um, so please come in, uh, have a discussion about that. I would love to talk one on one with anybody as well on this. Uh, if you want to come in there, I will have I'll be happy to reply to anything that you all have to say. Uh, and with that, uh, I will wrap this one up and I will hope to see all of you in another reading club or reading group. All right.